<laughs> well, what, a, what a joy it's been for my wife Mary and, and me to serve you this weekend. We've uh, had just a <coughs> wonderful time at the home of uh, Irfan, Irfan and Ann Hughes. We are just delighted to, to have this time uh, with them. I, known this dear brother, as he said, for 20 years, but to be with his wife and him in his own home has been very special. We, we love you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's been great this afternoon to be with the Kirby's for several hours and some guests and friends. It's great to meet some of you uh, for the first time. And your great book buyers too, which is always a little icing on the cake, because I love to see people walk away with good books that will feed their soul and Thank you, too, for listening so well to the messages. It's a, I told your, uh, your pastor, uh, Matthew Holtz, that it's just a wonderful church to serve, and you listen well. And thank you, Reverend Holtz, for having us as well on your, on your pulpit this weekend. So these days have been very encouraging days, in the midst of which we've been concerned about our daughter-in-law, we were in the Chicago airport, and my wife didn't know whether to go back home or whether to come with me because she had just gone to the hospital, and she's still in labor now. But uh, things seem to be progressing well, especially the last few hours, and she's getting some relief from an epidural now. But the monitor shows that the baby is still doing well, so we're hoping by the time we get home this evening, we might hear some really, really wonderful news or, or later in the night. So continue to pray for us, and thank you for, for your concern. We want to read now from 2 Kings 4. 2 Kings 4. A rather lengthy story, but one that you really need to hear in totality to understand the sermon tonight. And one that's not very familiar, perhaps, to some of us. But one that I think, boys and girls, will be very interesting to you. So we want to read from 2 Kings 4, verses 8 through 37. An interesting story, I say to you boys and girls, because it's about a boy who died and then was resurrected again from the dead. So let's read 2 Kings 4, beginning in verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, a little room, I pray thee, on the well, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that Elisha came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care, but what is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, 
carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Try to go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It's well. It's well. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thy hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. If any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was coming into him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in, and fell at his feet, and bowed herself to the ground, and took up her son, and went out. And God bless the sacred reading of his holy word. God calls us in our families to take spiritual inventory. We've been looking at marriage from a couple different perspectives, child rearing from a couple different perspectives. This morning we examined our own soul. Now tonight, if we're going to take reformation of the family, we need to take spiritual inventory. Is it well with our family? Is it well with you as a husband? Is it well with you as a wife? Is it well with your children? Is it well with the, verse 26, that means every individual, with you boys and girls, you young people, you older friends, grandparents, is it well with you. You see, if it's well in our families, if our families are truly reformed, we not only can say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, but we also learn something of what the Bible calls submission before our sovereign God. Sweet Savory, holy submission. If our families are going to be reformed,
reformed. God must be God. Martin Luther put it this way, letting God be God, bowing under him, is more than half of all true religion. Tonight, I want to probe that with you. What does it mean to bow under God? What does it mean to have true submission? And what does it not mean to be submissive? What does it mean to be able to say, under any circumstance, it is well. So with God's help, we want to look with you at this theme. It is well. Sweet, savory submission. We want to look at it from the perspective of expected faith for the future. Verse 23b, it shall be well. Then we want to look at it from the perspective of Submissive faith concerning the past, it is well. Despite their only son being dead at home. And then we want to look in the third place at this faith applied to the present. Is it well with you? So we go in our thoughts tonight to a little city, village you might say, about five miles north of Jezreel, called Shunem. Today it's still a poor, small village, surrounded by orchards and cactus hedges, and it's called Sola. On the outskirts of that little village, Sola, there are today archaeological remains of the biblical Shunem. One of our trips to Israel, our guide asked us, we had a little extra time one day, if I wanted to take the group to any other place in the near vicinity. We were close by Solom, and so I said, let's go to Solom and let's look at the archaeological remains of Shunem. And we did that. And still today, when you stand on the remains of Shunem, you can see in the distance, 15 miles away, Mount Carmel. And so you can picture the very road in which Elisha walked to his little seminary on Mount Carmel, where he was training prophets, and how convenient it was for him to stop along the way in Shunem to get some rest and energy to walk the last 15 miles of the way. So it appears that perhaps on a weekly basis or every other week, Elisha would make this journey and would go and teach the prophets for a few days, similar to a modern seminary, where a professor would come every other week or so. In fact, one of our professors does that. He comes every other week for the PhD program from Canada, and teaches for a week, and goes back home. This is what Elisha is doing. And we're told that in Shunem, there lived a very great woman. The original word translated great here means a woman of some prominence. She had some means. She was uh, well off. She and her husband had some means materially, but also she was a mature woman, a great woman, spiritual in the Lord. And this woman constrained the prophet Elisha to eat bread with her and her husband on his frequent journeys through their area. And later, she had her husband prepare then a separate room for the prophet. And out of gratitude, Elisha asked this woman, through his servant Gehazi, that was kosher in those days to do it that way, is there anything he could do for this woman, this great woman? Could he perhaps remember her to the king or to the captain of the army? Imagine that, boys and girls. If someone came along and said, I, I have the power to remember you to the President of the United States of America, or some other famous person with lots of money or lots of things to give you, what do you want? What do you think this woman said? Did she have a long grocery list of all kinds of things she wanted? She just said, I dwell among my own people. She 
just said, I'm content. I'm, I'm submissive with what I have in life. Everything is fine. I'm not looking for anything. I just want to serve the prophet without receiving anything in return. She expresses what Jeremiah Burroughs, the Puritan, called in his famous book, the rare jewel of Christian contentment. I dwell among my own people. I'm happy with my lot and my portion in life. What a, what a blessed thing to be able to say that. You see, by nature we're always seeking something more, or something different, or something better, or something richer, or something new. But she says, I dwell among my own people. See, when you're a true Christian, and you are well spiritually, you're not always hankering after things. But you're content. You're happy in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that Jesus, having Him as Savior and Lord, and knowing the triune God, this is your only comfort in life and death, that you belong to Him. This gives you what you need for this life and for a better life to come. This is the only thing that will give you comfort in both worlds, belonging to Jesus, being able to say in truth as we heard this morning, for me to live is Christ. Earthly possessions can be nice and pleasant. We can get some enjoyment out of them, but they will perish. But this comfort never perishes. So I wonder tonight, can, can you say with this woman, <clears throat> I just dwell among my own people. I am content. Now the amazing thing about this woman's confession is that she had had no children. <clears throat> she said, I dwell among my own people. And in, today, of course, it's, it's sad when someone can't have a child, a couple can't have a child. It's, it can be a burden. It's a big burden for a couple. But in those days, it was actually a sign of the curse of God upon the Israelitish woman that didn't have a child. Because secretly, every woman, Israelitish woman, wanted to be in the line of the Messiah to come. And was hoping that somehow either she would bear the Messiah himself or that her descendants would bear the Messiah. And so not to have a child was considered a huge, overwhelming burden, borderline curse of God. I hate this woman. Makes no mention of it. I dwell among my own people. It shows us, doesn't it, by implication, that this woman had learned to rest under this, this, this tremendous affliction. She had learned to rest in the will of the sovereign God. But Gehazi is aware of it. And Gehazi says to her, says to Elisha rather, she has no child. Elisha apparently gets some divine revelation at that point as a prophet. And he says, call her. And he tells her, one year from now, you are going to embrace a son. <laughs> it's overwhelming. And she said, no, no, Lord, my Lord. Don't deceive thy heaven. I mean, I, I'm really, I'm really beyond age now, and if this, this is not going to happen. You don't, you don't have to do anything for me. I, I'm, I'm used to this. But she has a son. Can you imagine when she bears that son? I mean, our daughter-in-law right now is in the hospital. She and her husband <coughs> could not have children for, for several years, and it was a burden for them. We were praying for them every day. And then that happy day came when they told us, we are expecting a child <laughs> after they had given up. As it were, God intervened. We were so happy. This woman, she must have been overjoyed with this son. This is a son of promise. This is a son given by a prophet. This is a son given by the hand of God in a special way. Oh, how she must have doted over that boy, don't you think? And loved that boy with all her heart and all her strength and all her mind. And then one day, it's unbelievable. You can't fathom it. The boy goes out into the field, 
gets some kind of sunstroke, must have been a warm day, his head hurts, his dad doesn't think it's too bad, but he says, you better get him out of the sun. Carry, carry the boy to his mother. And he sits on her knees till noon, and the Bible has a way, you know, instead of exaggerating things, it, it sort of, it just almost deadpans at some points. It just, just says things so, so plainly, understatedly, and died. Died? The son of promise? The son given by the, the prophet with divine pronouncement sat on her knees till noon and then died? What is God saying? This is a great woman. She's a woman that knows God. She knows that death is always the voice of God. Why would God give so wonderfully when she had no more expectation for a child and then take away so suddenly to accept that? To bow under that. That God's ways are above our ways. That nobody can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? That he's free to give and withhold. To realize that. To bow under the perfect sovereignty of God. Oh, what special grace is needed for this woman now. And then, he died. Son of promise. A child of prayer. A child given in love. The child given as a token of the Lord's favor. Is God angry with her? Is this the disfavor of God? Oh God, hast thou given this precious son so wonderfully only to take him away again as a punishment for all my sins and all my transgressions? You can imagine the riddles, the questions that would naturally flow into the heart of this woman. Maybe you too have been under great trials in life. And you were just staggered. You, you received word you've got cancer, or your, or your child died, or you got in a serious accident, or you lost your job suddenly. And you're just overwhelmed with riddles and with questions about why and what happened and where is God in all of this. Well, by grace, by grace, this woman actually doesn't respond this way. She's a great woman. And she responds with amazing, submissive, sweet, savory faith. The Bible says she went out and went up and laid the boy on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. That's an amazing response. I'd like to suggest to you that there is faith in every one of those phrases. Active faith. You see, in the first place, she went up. She didn't go down. She didn't just fall into depression. She went up. Secondly, she laid him on the bed of the man of God. Not out of anger. Because you see, whatever came into contact with the dead was considered unclean. Some people think, well, she, she was angry at the prophet and she laid him on the bed of the man of God to get back at him and say, you know, you gave me this boy and I'm going to make your room, your little special room, I'm going to make it unclean. No, no. No. By laying the bed, boy in the bed of the man of God, she was like Abraham when he went up the mountain with Isaac and we read in Hebrews, I and the lad will return to you again means that he believed that even if he had to kill his son Isaac on the mount, God would be able to raise him up from the dead again. She lays him on the bed of the man of God out of believing expectation. And then she shuts the door upon him. That took faith. Can you imagine if, if someone found that boy dead on the bed of the man of God and they did an investigation? She'd be accused of child abuse. She would be because... In that culture, you have to bury someone the same day they die. Or the bodies will stink because of the heat. So she cannot be found out, you see. She shuts the door by faith. And she, she went out. She wanted to go to the, to the man of God. Because Elisha, in her mind, of course, and rightly so, represented the prophet of God. And through the prophets of God, God can do great acts. 
In her mind, God, God's ability to resurrect from the dead is something that would go through the prophet, naturally. So she wants to go to find Elisha. So by faith she rises up. By faith she lays him on the bed of the man of God. By faith she shuts the door upon him. And by faith she goes out. And then she faces another trial. Now Elisha is gone. He's at Mount Carmel. He's 15 miles away. A woman in those days isn't supposed to travel alone 15 miles. But she sends a message to her husband. Get, get me a donkey. I'm going to go to the man of God. And then another trial. Why do you want to go to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. How is she going to respond? Is she going to give up? Is she going to say, well, this must just all be my own doing. I might as well accept it. I might as well just go bury my son. Well, she says something remarkable. Verse 23b. She says, Shalom. That's the message she sends back to her husband. But future tense, it shall be well. Shalom. It shall be peace. That's what the word shalom means. As if to say, don't worry, husband. I will take the donkey. I will go to the man of God and come again. And all shall be well. Don't worry. And uh, her message is received by the husband. It seems, it appears anyway. He accepts that. And he just keeps on working. And she gets a servant. She says, slap that by riding. Accept that bidding. He rides as fast as he can. And there she goes, five mile, five hour journey. Oh man, imagine what's going through her mind in those five hours. The Bible is silent. As far as we know, her faith did not waver. And Elisha sees her coming. What a what an amazing thing. I wonder when you look to the future. Take a spiritual inventory now of yourself, your husband, your wife, your children. When you look to the future, do you, do you trust the Lord? Do you trust the Lord when, when things seem to go against you? When things are overwhelming? We, we all have difficulty, don't we, with such times and such things and with such questions that this woman faced. It's so hard sometimes to say, Shalom. It shall be well. But really, when we're healthy, when our soul is under the influ influence of what we call the Reformation, that God-centered faith, we ought to know something of this. Maybe not to the degree we, we desire, but something of putting our trust <coughs> for the future with all its complexities, with all its disappointments, with all of its challenges, with all of its fears into the hands of the Lord. Shalom, it shall be well. Now Elisha sees her, I say, coming from a long way off. He sends Gehazi to meet her, doesn't he? And Gehazi comes with the questions that Elisha asked him to bring to her. Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answers, Shalom. <laughs> In the original Hebrew. Shalom, peace. But now, present tense, referring to the past. It is well. God has made things well with my husband, with me, and with the boy. You say, what? How in the world can she say that? You know, maybe if you walk into church today and somebody said, how are you doing? And you've got a bad cold, you're not feeling well, you've got some pain, and you said, oh, I'm well. Because you didn't want to stop and tell them the whole story. You didn't really tell them the whole truth. And imagine if every time you ask somebody, how are you doing, they, they told you every ache and pain in their body. I mean, it'd be a very tedious business. But you said, it's well. But that's not the way this woman said shalom. She says, shalom and bowing under the ways of God. In, in Hebrew, it's just one word. Shalom. I got peace. I got peace inside. But well, my only son, my only son, is dead at home. Now that's amazing. How can you do that? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, that raises the whole question of what really is submission? 
What is true submission? And what is not true submission? Or rather, what is what submission is not? We need to look at both sides of that, of that coin. I'll show you why. First of all, true submission is like four <clears throat> steps, one deeper than the other. The first is this, acknowledging the Lord. You can never be submissive to God if you don't first acknowledge this is the Lord's doing. It is the Lord. Remember the week 9-11? I didn't see it myself, but I was told that Larry King had four ministers on his show, and one of them was John MacArthur. And he asked the other three first, where is God in all of this? And they all said, well, God is nowhere. And they asked, God has nothing to do with this. This is just murderous thugs and terrorists from Islam. You can't bring God into the equation at all. Then he got to John MacArthur. He said, what do you think? And John MacArthur says, well, if, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, if God has nothing to do with this, then, then we're dealing with an impotent God. God has everything to do with this. God is sovereign. Nothing happens by chance. And they gave a wonderful testimony. You see, submission begins by saying, no matter what happens to you, it is the Lord. When Aaron's two sons were taken, Eli's two sons were taken, Job's children were taken, they all acknowledged, either by silence or by speech, it is the Lord. The Lord killeth, and the Lord maketh alive, 1 Samuel 2, verse 6 says. And the psalmist says, I was dumb with silence, I opened up my mouth, because thou didst it. You see, the only way you can be truly submissive before God is to recognize the hand of God in everything. You know, when Shimei is cursing David, instead of David going over there and killing him, he said, let Shimei curse, for the Lord hath bidden him to curse David. It is the Lord. That's the beginning point of true submission. Secondly, True submission doesn't only acknowledge the Lord and say it is the Lord, but it justifies the Lord and says it is right. I deserve nothing more or better. Aaron held his peace when fire came down from heaven to consume his two sons. What does he say? I don't deserve more. When David's throne was taken over by his own son Absalom, he said, Behold, here am I, that the Lord do to me as seemeth good unto him. What is he saying? It's just. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be on the throne. You see, all of these confessions in the Bible are rooted in two experiential truths engraven upon the souls of those who confess them. God's sovereignty and my sinfulness. And when those two come together, we will say, no matter what happens to us, not why me, but why not me, it is just, it is righteous, I deserve even worse. This noon I was reminded by uh, one among us tonight of uh, something that happened to me when I was in Grand Rapids and went to Butterworth Hospital, got on the elevator floor one, the lady came in, and we, went up, we went up to floor seven together, the only ones on the elevator. So I started talking to her, I thought I had about a minute and a half maybe to evangelize her, and, and I uh, began with the weather, and I said, it's a good thing we're not in control of the weather, and how people complain about the weather. She's saying, yes, yes, and she said, oh, yes, yeah. she said, that's right. She said, because my mother always told me anything above ground is the mercy of the Lord. Suddenly I realized she's evangelizing me. <laughs> she's saying, isn't she, anything but death and hell is the mercy of the Lord. So we deserve nothing but death and hell. We deserve nothing but being below the ground. And you see, once you realize that in your life, you realize that you deserve nothing whatsoever but death and hell, then you are thankful and you can be submissive for whatever you receive. 
Happy people are not people that think they've got a lot coming, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Happy people are people that think they've got nothing coming. And they can't believe what the Lord gives them. That's why when you go on mission fields to very, very poor places, I've seen this over and over and over again. It's amazing how happy the people are with the smallest things in life. We, cultured, pampered Americans, our level of happiness is actually the studies that have been done about happiness around the world in different places. We're actually not on the very high of the scale. Because we tend to think the more we get, the more we deserve, and we don't see ourselves as unworthy, hell-worthy sinners in the sight of a holy and a righteous God who deserves so much better from us. And so true submission justifies God. Why not me? Thirdly, true submission not only acknowledges the Lord, it justifies the Lord, but it also approves of the Lord. This goes deeper. Then this says, not only it is the Lord and it is right, but it is well. It is well. I trust the Lord. I trust that the Lord knows what he's doing with me. I put my reins and my life in his hands. He knows what I need better than I do. It is well. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Job said, Blessed be. When the Lord wiped out all ten of his children, blessed be the name of the Lord. This goes very deep. And you never come to this point without the grace of God. To approve God when he seems to come against you. It is well. Shalom. There is peace. It is right, it is best, it is good, what thou hast done, O oh Lord. Now we had an elder in our church here who had knee surgery and he got an infection in it afterward. He was quite weak and frail, had a lot of chronic pain in his body, suffering tremendously. And he had to go back in for knee surgery. He felt, he felt so sorry for him. And then it happened again. And again. And finally, third, fourth surgery, I don't know how many there were, but it seemed to work. We were all rejoicing with him. No infection. Well, finally, one day, he calls me up and he says, Pastor, I've got to tell you, I got an infection in it again. The doctor says, probably my leg has to come off. I said, oh, brother, I feel for you. I'm so, so sorry to hear that. Oh, no, he says, don't be sorry. My father must have more to teach me. It is well. You see, and then he said this, Father knows best. It's like you boys and girls. Sometimes you don't understand why your mom or dad might say, or your dad might say to you, I don't think that's good for you to do. Maybe you don't understand it yet, but you trust your dad, don't you? And you say, my dad knows best. But when you're a true Christian and you're in your right place before God, that's what you say. My Father in heaven knows best. Best. He knows exactly what I need. Now all of us have been through affliction. Some of us have been through a lot of affliction. Some of us have gone through very deep ways in our lives. And I want to say this to you tonight. One of the sweetest experiences of life is to be able to say it is well when I'm in the belly of affliction, in the furnace of affliction. Because I sense that the fourth one is the first one. Jesus is walking in the midst of that furnace with me. And I believe that, that not one hair of my head shall be singed, that somehow they'll bring me out and all things shall be well. And so what is well with our soul? We are able to look back in the past, because this shalom is, 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 a, is a past tense thing with the present tense application. We're able to look back in the past and say, Lord, I've needed every affliction you've ever sent my way my entire life, and I wouldn't do without one of them. Then I amen every difficult way God has led me through. And though I don't understand, 
understand it all. I do understand some of it. I do understand this much, that to break me in order to use me, I needed the afflictions that came my way. This is a sweet thing, a glorious thing. To approve of God when it seems to come against you. Show up. By nature, and even after we receive grace, our nature is not inclined to this at all. But God can teach us this. And when, 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 when spiritual life is alive, and we look back over our lives, we can say, Amen, <clears throat> to every dealing, negative, seemingly negative dealing God has ever had with us. Have you ever experienced that? It is well. There's one more step. <coughs> Clinging to the Lord. Clinging to the Lord. Acknowledging the Lord. Justifying the Lord. Approving the Lord. Cleaving to the Lord. Clinging to the Lord as my greatest friend. And he seems to come against me as my greatest enemy. To kiss the end of the rod that smites me. is incredible submission. I was once in London, England, actually waiting to preach in, in, in the Met Metropolitan Tabernacle. And I was in a little park. I was all alone. And a woman walks in with a, a large dog. And she has a little container with a ball in it and a little release valve of some kind. And as the dog walks in front of her, she suddenly takes that thing and she wings it at the dog. And that ball, that hard ball, smacks the side of that dog. I thought, oh, I jumped. I thought, that woman's in trouble. That dog's in. But the dog just picked the ball up and brought it back to her. It was amazing. Then she did it again and again. And I watched this with fascination. This dog would bring back every ball that hit him to his own. And then it dawned on me. That's what I'm not doing with the Lord when he strikes me. I'm not bringing it back to him like this dog. Joyful. Trusting him. Claiming to him. In the midst of affliction. As my greatest friend. When he seems to be coming against me as the one to hurt me. I'm not doing what Job did. In Job 13, when he said, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. That's what happens in true affliction. When it's sanctified to our soul. So true submission, you see, acknowledges the Lord, justifies the Lord, approves the Lord, and clings to the Lord. But that does not mean, that does not mean, that true submission doesn't feel the pain. The dog felt the pain. The believer feels the pain. True submission is not, give me, let me give you three things, it is not a taking away of the sense or feeling of the affliction. That's why the Shunammite went on to the prophet and clung to his feet and her soul was vexed and still it was well. You know, if we're not vexed inwardly, then you don't need to have any submission. There's a woman in my church, and she didn't have a very good relationship with her husband, and he died. And two years later, on one of my visits to her, I asked her how she was doing. She said, I'm doing fine. I said, are you lonely sometimes? Oh, no, she said. You know, God has given me so much submission, I've never missed my husband at all. Thank you. Something's not right there. You see, if submission doesn't cost you pain, it's not submission. Submission is bowing under God when you're in the midst of pain. That's what this woman is doing. This is true submission. Here, shalom, when her soul is vexed within her. You see, those of you who are not Christians, may I just say to you, in love, this, this, this is really your problem. You're over and you're unvexed. 
You're not bothered that you're not ready for eternity. You're not ready to die. And you don't know the true joy of life. It doesn't bother you. And so you, you're not submitting under this that you're on earth. Because there's no pain. There's no sense of missing. There's no, no longing for God. You're just going on your own way, aren't you? Or are you? Do you feel the void? Do you feel the emptiness? Are you trying to fill your, as the old Dutch saying would be, trying to fill your triangular heart with the round world? It will not happen. There will always be a void, you see. You need to know what you're missing. And you're missing Christ. You're missing everything. You're missing the great joy, the great purpose of life. The only way of salvation. Would to God your soul was vexed. Would to God you felt the pain of separation from him and cried out, men and brethren, what shall I do to be saved? Would to God you would repent and believe the gospel and that it would become well with your soul. Yes, submission is not taking away of the feeling of the affliction. But secondly, submission is not avoiding, seeking for the reason of God's providential dispensations. <clears throat> I've often had people in my church, actually all three churches, they say that when they get into affliction, they say something like this to me. Well, I know we're not supposed to ask God why. Is that true? Yes, you're not supposed to ask God why with a fist in rebellion. But doesn't David ask God why when he says, with open palms, search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, and root out every evil way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, I wrestled with this question actually when I was a teenager, and I was reading through Matthew 27, and I came to this verse. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If Jesus asked why, and he's the sinless one, it's not wrong for a true believer, searching his own heart, taking spiritual inventory of his own soul, to say, show me, O Lord, why? Does it mean God will always show you right away? He may answer the prayer a week later. He may answer the prayer a year later. He may answer the prayer on the day of judgment. Paul never knew why he had the thorn in the flesh. But this much is true. What I do know, thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. God will show us why when we come to him with earnestness and desire. And thirdly, finally, true submission is not sitting back with indifference and folded arms saying, well, if the Lord is going to come to help me or to convert me, he will do it. And then go on your own way. No, no. Elisha wanted to send Gehazi ahead of him with his staff to put on the child. But the woman wasn't satisfied with that. I don't want the staff. She says, I want you, Elisha. You are the prophet of God. As the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. <coughs> and Elisha comes. You see, true submission is not just passive. Let go, let God. No. True submission is active, using the means, looking to the Lord, resting in His will, but at the same time, dealing with the situation. And you know the result, of course. Elisha did go and pray, stretched himself upon the child, the flesh of the child waxed warm, he sneezed seven times, opened his eyes, and Elijah delivered the boy to the mother. Happy end. To a very moving story. And when we read these words, then she went in. First, <clears throat> then she went out. Now she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground. That's what happens, you see. When God answers our cries, we go into the Lord, we fall at his feet, we bow ourselves to the ground. She took up her son and then and went out. The same language. She laid him on the bed of the man of God and went out. Now she took up her son and went out. You see, shalom, 
The shalom of the future and the shalom of the past now becomes the shalom of the present in fulfillment. God answers her request. All things are made well. O oh Lord, to thee be all the honor and be all the glory. But now finally, let me just apply this to you in just a few minutes. To the present. Is it well? Is it well with you? You see, if it's well with us tonight, and we are part of the reformation of our own family, then spiritual gift of submission is something that we know something about. It doesn't mean that we, we don't murmur sometimes, but we have a desire to bow unto God. We know what it means to bow unto God to some degree. We're not always where we want to be, but we're not a stranger of this spiritual submission. Trusting God. Letting God be God. It's dwell with you. Have, you, have you. have you let God be God in your life? Do you know what it means to bow under His ways? To acknowledge Him. To trust in Him. To approve of Him. To cling to Him. Do you know what it means to cling to Him? Even when you can see no light at the end of the tunnel. Just to cry out to Him. Sometimes maybe you can't even cry out more than the word Lord. You can't even frame. You're so needy. You're so overwhelmed. With your own unworthiness and with your own afflictions and with all that seems to come against you. And all the afflictions that come in at you like ocean waves. But all you can say is, Lord Jesus, I can't even put words together to pray. But do thou pray for me at the Father's right hand. That I may have the submission I need to trust thee. And to say, Father knows best. Is dwell with you. You know the very song that is well with my soul is written in that kind of submission <coughs> for the author who lost his own children at sea. That's why he cried out. It is well with my soul because he gave it all to the Lord. Is it well with my husband? Is it well with you as a wife? Is it well with your spouse? That's the question. You see it in your spouse. Despite their infirmities, despite their tendencies, maybe, maybe not to be submissive, can you see times and places where your spouse yearns to give everything over to the Lord? Is it well with your spouse? And is it well with your children? Children, you need this just as much as your mom and dad. To bow under God. You too face afflictions and trials in your life. You need to give them over to the Lord. And bow under God. And let God be God. You see, if it's well with our soul, we learn to give our soul over to the Lord, but also the events of our lives over to the Lord. We learn to trust the Lord in everything, our spiritual life, our natural life. And because He's gracious, because He's a God of mercy, because our hope is in Him through Jesus, because Jesus was forsaken, we believe that we will never be forsaken. And so we say it as well. Peace, shalom. God will make everything well. In the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, He is my peace. He's my mediator. He's the one who brings me to God. <clears throat> And brings God and me together and reconciles us in His mercy. You remember what a blessing it was in your spiritual life when you first realized you were lost and you cried out for God. And God showed you His Son through His Word. And you came to see that your salvation was an impossibility from your side because you could never save yourself. But it became a necessity because you couldn't go on without God. And then God showed you His Son. And by grace you received him and embraced him. And it was made well with your soul. And everything was well. Remember when that happened to me as a teenager. I walked outside. And God can do this more gradually. Or he can do it more suddenly as he did in my case. But I, I walked outside and it was just as if. It was just as if the grass was greener. If the birds, as if, if the birds sang 
sing more beautifully. As if all of nature was full of glory and beauty. The whole of the heavens was filled with the glory of God. Oh, the shalom that flows into a sinner's heart when he finds peace with Jesus, my unconverted friend. That's what you need. Shalom in Christ. But it's one thing to be reconciled with God in the state of my soul. It's another to be reconciled to his daily dealings with me. And when we're converted, we need that. Every day. Every day we need. There's such murmurers in this wilderness. They're so quick to complain. I speak. I'm preaching to myself. I hope you understand. And we hate ourselves for that murmuring. I've had times I sat at my desk and I actually hit my desk with my fist and said, you stupid fool. Why don't you trust the Lord? He's been faithful to you 10,000 times. Why don't you bow? Give it over to him. Stop resisting. Stop kicking against the pricks. Is it well with your soul? Show up. Peace in Jesus. For my state and for my daily condition. I need him in every way. Shalom for my justification through the blood of Christ. Shalom for my sanctification through the blood of Christ. Shalom for my wisdom through the blood of Christ. Shalom for my total redemption through the blood of Christ. <clears throat> he is given of God unto me for wisdom and justification and sanctification and redemption. He's my all in all. He's my peace. Because he took up the battle. He took up the holy war. He went into the sieve of Satan. He endured the essence of hell. And he could throw open the gates of heaven for me. All my shalom is in Jesus Christ. What a gospel. Amen. It is well. It is well with my soul. So if it is well with your soul, the world is being increasingly crucified to your heart. If it is well with your soul, Jesus Christ is increasing and self is decreasing, as we heard this morning. If it is well with your soul, you're becoming less self-centered and more God-centered. If it is well with your soul, you are poor in spirit. You mourn over sin. You're meek. You hunger and thirst after the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You show mercy to others. You're peacemakers. The fruit of the Spirit <coughs> flows into you. Fruits of love and joy and peace and self-control is well with your soul. May God give reformation to our families, the husband-wife relationship, the parent-child relationship, but also our personal relationship with God, as well as our family relationship to one another. May it be marked by submission. You wives. It is well with your soul when you show your husband respect and submission. And don't take the reins of everything into your own hands, but seek the wisdom of his headship. He functions and marriages to function. And you children, it is well with your soul when you show obedience to your father and mother out of love to Christ and realize God has given you your parents to lead you and guide you. And you husbands and fathers, it is well with your soul when you show your submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and you bow under Him. And so lead your family with Christ-like love as Christ has loved the church. You want reformation of the family. Do you really want it? Of your family. You can't have it without an experiential shalom in the bottom of your soul. May the peace of God that passes all understanding fill your soul in Christ Jesus now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Great God of heaven, we thank thee so much for the gospel. We thank thee for sweet, savory submission grounded in the submission of thy dear Son in Gethsemane, at Gabbatha, on Golgotha, and throughout his entire 33-year pilgrimage. Lord, 
May thy son, substitutionary obedience, be the ground of our shalom with thee, and may we find in thee a peace that passes all understanding, and a joy and a comfort by which we can say, this is my comfort, my only comfort in life and death, that I don't belong anymore to myself, but to my faithful Savior, who with his precious blood has defeated Satan and preserves me so that I want henceforth to live unto him. Bless us now, O oh God, and bless this uh, conference this weekend. Be with uh, Pastor Matthew as he as he leads the flock from week to week. Continue to bless him here, Lord. We thank you for him and for the other pastors and elders and leadership team. Bless them. Bless this church. Help them to grow qualitatively, quantitatively. Let thy kingdom come and let there be a, a shalom that rests in Shiloh, the very name of this church, so that this church may flourish in its people and its families and be reformed in the presence of the triune God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.